Robert Green of Herbius Point, Chairman of Asia House, Mr. Michael Lawrence, Chief Executive of Asia House, Excellencies, Honoured Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. I don't propose to give a keynote address. I intend to make a few points and I perhaps prefer to hear from you and have a discussion with you. First, <coughs> excuse me. I think we are all living in interesting times. And there are three sets of decisions, three sets of choices that will probably determine our collective future. Let me start with the first, and that is the US-China relations. The key question is how will US and China relate to each other, and that will determine the global geopolitical backdrop for all trade and economics to happen. The current US-China trade frictions is but a symptom that reflects more fundamental contradictions within their economies and societies. That's my hypothesis. We cannot discuss the US-China trade friction, trade deficits, without being cognizant of the challenges within their respective economies. Let me start with the US. The US trade deficit cannot be seen in isolation without understanding the US fiscal policy and monetary posture. For those of us who study economics and understand the GDP equation very well, you will know what I mean. The second internal challenge of the US is how will it reconcile the differential growth rates between the coastal states that are benefiting much from globalization and some of the other states that do not benefit as much. How will the US redistribute the unequal spread of benefits from globalization will be the second internal challenge of the US. Last but not least for the US, the US will have to decide how it will, can maintain its dynamism And this dynamism has for many years been underpinned by a system of being open to global trade and talent flows. On the side of the Chinese, they too have their fair share of challenges. And there are at least three. First, how will the Chinese rebalance their economy between an investment-led system and a consumption-led growth. Second, how will the Chinese reconcile state-led capitalism with the need for market discipline in all that it does? Third, how will the Chinese unleash the potential of its huge population without losing political control. So the US and Chinese relationships are at a crossroads. To resolve their bilateral relationships and bring it to the next higher plane, to put it on a positive footing, both of them will need to seriously consider how they manage their domestic challenges. Because failure to address their domestic challenges leading to a local backlash will bring about global consequences. 
and both the US and the Chinese as the largest players on the geopolitical scene has a choice to make. To paraphrase Vice President Joe Biden, both can decide if they were to demonstrate the power of their example or to demonstrate the example of their power. So this set of questions will determine the future of US-China relationship and this will set the global backdrop of what we have to overcome collectively as a global system. Let me move on now to the second set of challenges that perhaps the audience here would be very much involved in and interested. And that is the EU and the UK beyond Brexit. I can understand and I can appreciate that a lot of effort and attention, especially in the recent months, have been focused on how do we get to Brexit. But perhaps I will reframe that perspective by asking another question. And perhaps that is a more important question. How does the EU, and for that matter, the UK, want to relate to the world beyond Brexit. What happens after the 30th of March 2019? And perhaps that is a more important question. Because the issue is this. Brexit or not, what role does the EU want to play on the global stage? Is it one of integration, or is it one of isolation? Challenges there will be, and the EU has its fair share of challenges. Immigration, differential fiscal posture, so on and so forth. All of us have our fair share of challenges. But the question is, collectively, how does the EU want to relate to the rest of the world? Will the EU exercise leadership for the global trading system? Or will the EU be so wrapped up in its own internal challenges that it becomes isolated in its own problems? The EU has a chance to exercise leadership, even in Asia. As we speak, the EU has on its end at least three free trade agreements with Japan, Singapore and Vietnam. On one level, these free trade agreements are an expression of our desire to lower the barriers to trade, but that is just on one level. On a more significant level is whether the EU sees itself working with Asia to integrate our production and value chains in order to leverage on each other's relative comparative advantages. That this is a statement of our collective determination to come together to leverage on the best from each other. So we hope that the EU Singapore FTA will soon get its way through the European Parliament. We will learn how to navigate this carefully and shepherd the process through the European Parliament. But we hope that we will never lose sight of the fact that these free trade agreements 
investment protection agreements are not just about lowering barriers to trade, but more significantly about the EU statement to the rest of the world of how it wants to integrate and connect with the rest of the world and to leverage on each other's relative comparative advantage to bring our respective economies to a higher plane. Likewise, Brexit or not, the UK has to answer those same questions. How will the UK relate to the rest of the world? Especially in Asia, where the UK and together, collectively with the European countries, have a significant presence in Asia. And as we were saying, it will be a shame for either the UK or the European community to walk away from this leadership position. Let me touch on the third set of issues that we will have to confront today. And that is Asia's relevance in the new emerging global order. I can safely and confidently say that no one in Asia wants to choose sides. Although some may feel that they have no choice but to choose sides. No one wants to see the world being balkanized into different trading blocks where you are either with me or not with me. Everyone in Asia wants to see a more integrated global community. And the question is, how can Asia do this against the backdrop of what's happening between the US and China and the posture that the EU wants to take? Asia will need to strengthen our efforts to create relevance. To create relevance regardless of what is happening between the US and China. Asia cannot be looking for the spoils of war, as they say, but instead it has to create relevance by once again redoubling our efforts to integrate our economies. Once again, to leverage on each other's relative comparative advantages. To bring out the best in each other. And this is the reason why the CPTPP, the ongoing RCEP negotiations, the ASEAN economic community, and all these efforts are so important. All these efforts speak to the same urgent need for us to integrate our economies rather than to choose sides or to fragment our global and regional production and value chains. For example, the growing digital economy is a tremendous opportunity for economies in Asia and the rest of the world to come together. It is an opportunity for greater integration. But if we don't seize that opportunity, then we also risk balkanization into digital islands, isolated digital islands, which, is, which contradicts the very essence of data and digital flows to bring about a more integrated world. And this is where Asia, together with like-minded partners in Europe, America and elsewhere, must come together to evolve the WTO system beyond that taking care of the traditional conventional goods and services sector to look at what are the new rules we require for the digital economy to enable the digital economy to grow, flourish and integrate. So these are the three sets of challenges that we have to confront today. How the US and China relate to each other and thereby exercising their leadership for the global system. How the EU and the UK decide on its priority for the day after Brexit, with or without Brexit. 
how Asia come together to create relevance for itself. So on that note, I'll be happy to hear your views, share thoughts, and then perhaps we can all, in our respective circle of influence, help to bring about a more integrated world that will bring out the best in each of us for the good of our people. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you for eloquently outlining the key challenges, the three key challenges as you see them. I want to touch on the first initially. Uh, President Trump and President Xi are due to meet in Argentina on the sidelines of the G20 uh, in just over a week. Uh, most aren't optimistic that there'll be any breakthrough. Are you expecting any material breakthrough in the tensions between the US and China over the course of the next week? I won't hold my breath. <laughs> and the reasons are as what I have said. We can't look at the US-China relationship in isolation. We can't look at the US-China trade relationship in isolation. To resolve some of the contradictions in the trade relationship, we have to look deeper to resolve some of the more fundamental contradictions in the respective economies. And unless and until we manage some of those underlying contradictions, it will be hard for both US and China to come to a quick resolution. We all look forward to a quick resolution because it provides certainty for the world. And I think the greatest damage is the uncertainty cost rather than where it finally lands. And I think as business people, all of you will want a predictable environment. And that's what we all hope for. But we also hope that both the US and China can put their relationship in the broader perspective. That it is not just about bilateral interests, which of course are important, that there are also global leadership interests that both of them have to exercise as the largest economies in the world. Given it seems unlikely there's going to be any short-term resolution, and given this could be protracted in the uncertainties you touched on. I, I hope I'll be pleasantly surprised. And, and I think many, many would agree. Uh, what is the greatest risk? Is it to growth? Is it countries choosing sides, as you, you, you mentioned earlier, and therefore going down a path that may not be long-term beneficial? I think there are a couple of risks. First, if uncertainty leads to businesses withholding their investment decisions, then I think there will be quite serious implications on the world economy. And as many financial analysts would say, we are in the late cycle of the financial markets. If this coincides with a loss of investors' confidence globally, then we might be in for a rough ride. Mm -hmm. So this is one set of risks that we have to manage. The other, as you have mentioned, is that will we end up seeing a fragmentation of the global production and value chain? I think the world is a much better place if we can leverage on each other's comparative advantage. And that's the basis of trade. Today, for any secondary, tertiary products, it's hard pressed to say that this is produced mm. entirely in country X. You take out any of the smartphones that we have in our pockets. I always like this story. The MIT did a study. Can anyone produce the iPhone entirely within its geographical boundaries? The answer is, well, yes, not impossible. Today, this is the price of the iPhone. If you try to onshore everything, this will be the price of the iPhone. But even if you try to onshore everything, you don't have all the necessary raw materials to do so. And if you want to find substitute to all the necessary materials, then the price will be here. 
So is the world better for that? I'm not so sure. So I think if we look at it logically, the global mega trend is towards greater integration. But having said that, whether is it the US, the Chinese, or the Europeans, we all have to manage the domestic challenges that comes with global integration. Because it requires businesses to evolve. It requires workers to be retrained so that they can get on to new businesses, take on new jobs. But this is easier said than done. Yes. And unless every country has the political will and the political capacity to make some of these internal adjustments, we will find ourselves having a great idea, but unable to benefit from it fully because we can't reconcile the domestic challenges. So we are looking at possibly a generation of uncertainty. Because these domestic challenges are not insubstantial for China and the US, and the knock-on effects of not resolving the dispute could go on for years. Well, it depends on whether you are optimistic or pessimistic. And what do you Let's take the EU as an example. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the EU as an example. I was studying in the UK when the European experiment came on some 30 years back. At that point in time, I vividly remembered few, if any, of my professors in Cambridge ever gave the EU any chance of success. And there are good economic logic why the EU shouldn't have survived for so many years. And the fundamental question was, how can you have an integrated market without an integrated fiscal policy, an integrated monetary policy, a coherent labour movement, labour mobility policy? So you can criticise the EU for all you want, but you must admit that the EU has succeeded beyond the wildest imagination of my professors. <laughs> and, you know, and now if my professors, if they're still around, and they look at Brexit, and they could have easily turned around and say, I told you so. <laughs> but those are inherent challenges, just to take the EU and UK as an example. In the UK, why is it the vote for Brexit is so low in London, whereas the vote for Brexit is so much higher in some of the Midlands places. And that's because London has been a beneficiary of that integration with EU and that integration with the global economy. But some other places in the Midlands and elsewhere may not have benefited as much. They may have benefited, but they may not have benefited as much and that is a challenge. And many in the Midlands will have to be rescued to take on new jobs. And it's not easy. And if any country cannot resolve some of these internal challenges, you will always be faced with a bigger issue of how and if you can even talk about that politically to your domestic audience. Yes. As someone says, all politics is local. Yes. So I, I'm not entirely pessimistic that you will last a generation. Uh, by the way, nowadays it's very hard to say how long is a generation. <laughs> uh, in the internet world, a generation can be a few years. Yes. <laughs> uh, in, perhaps in our generation, generation can mean generations. But. It depends also on politics, whether the respective political systems have the political will, courage and capacity to take on some of these challenges. Even for Singapore as a small open economy, we have our fair share of challenges. We do not pro believe in protecting the jobs, but we believe in protecting the workers. We believe that it is not enough just to place today's unemployed into today's job, nor is it sufficient to place today's unemployed into tomorrow's job. Our grand goal, grand vision, is to place tomorrow's unemployed into tomorrow's jobs ahead of time. Easier said than done. 
because you need to convince people to change, you need to convince businesses to evolve ahead of time. And it's human nature for us to ask, why should I get out of my comfort zone and be ready for the future ahead of time, especially when the future is uncertain? But unless and until we can do that well in our respective countries, there will be a pushback towards this idea that we will all benefit from global integration. And I think people can understand that global, those benefits that come from global integration is just how you overcome some of these domestic issues. Okay. The Minister is keen to hear from you, your questions, uh, your comments. Uh, please put your hand in the air and we'll bring around a, a microphone. Uh, I'll just ask one question as people prepare their thinking. Martin, I will get to you. Um, you talked about the relevance of Asia. Have you found, do you get a sense that your uh, neighbours are now more keen for integration, say with ASEAN, in terms of the ASEAN economy, and to embrace multilateral deals because of the tensions of US and China? Is it driving, is it accelerating integration yes. cooperation? In Certainly. Region? I, I sense that, and this is why this year during our chairmanship of the ASEAN and, my, and our chairmanship of the RCEP process, you see the greater urgency demonstrated by all the 16 partner countries to want to conclude the RCEP as soon as possible, notwithstanding the differences in our level of aspirations. I think everyone of my counterparts understand that the RCEP is not just about lowering of tariffs, it's not just about harmonizing our rules, but more importantly, it is about allowing our businesses, our economies to be much more integrated to leverage on each other's relative comparative advantage. Okay, let's turn over to questions. I think, Sherry, you had your this microphone, please, just here at the front. Thanks. Minister, thank you very much for your uh, comments. Could I ask you about um, your government's view of the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, I was in Washington recently, and it's difficult to overstate the antipathy, particularly in the White House, towards Belt and Road. Uh, I work for a bank, HSBC, which is very committed to helping China going out, being part of that story. And I wondered what your view was um, for the government of Singapore. We see the Belt and Road Initiative as a natural development of the Chinese economic trajectory. 40 years ago, Deng Xiaoping made the decision to open up the Chinese economy, but not just to open up the Chinese economy, but to integrate the Chinese economy with the world's economy. Since two, three years back, FDI into China has been exceeded by ODI out from China. China has reached a stage of development whereby it will have to grow by going out of China. And it's a positive development for China and for the world. So it is a natural trajectory that we should all expect that China will increasingly want to invest beyond its shores. And China would also want to secure its own supply chains and lines of communications. So that is to be ex expected. Then the question is, how does it work? I don't think there's any problem with what President Xi Jinping has enunciated as a vision for greater integration, for the benefits to spread to the region. The question is one of execution. All projects, be it Belt and Road or non-Belt and Road projects, will be best executed if it maintains a market discipline. Evaluate each project on its own through the market lenses and execute it through the market mechanism. But if the people executing this decides to add in all kinds of non-economic considerations, then I think they do injustice to President Xi's vision. And they will then create a lot of misunderstanding 
to the intent of President Xi's vision. Many of these projects are long-term projects. They require stability, they require the rule of law, they require us to give confidence to the investors. <coughs> and if you look at the Asia's demands for infrastructure project, it's tremendous. So it is a good coincidence of interest, but execution is key. One third of all Chinese Belt and Road investments come through Singapore. They don't come to Singapore, but they come through Singapore. Why do they come through Singapore? Because Singapore offers our experience and expertise in the areas of legal and financial syndication. It provides investors the confidence, the rule of law, the platform to reach out to third party countries. And this is how Singapore works with China. And so long as we maintain market discipline in each and every of the Belt and Road projects, I think it will benefit China, it will benefit the region and the respective economies. But having said that, I must say this. Every Belt and Road project is a joint responsibility between the investor and the recipient countries. Both need to exercise good judgment on the economic viability of the project. It is not China's responsibility alone. Next question, please. Martin, I think you had your hand in there. Yes. There. Okay. <coughs> Natalie, please. Microphone over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalie Black, the UK government's new uh, trade commissioner for Asia Pacific, based here in Singapore. Um, thank you very much, Minister, for your very thoughtful remarks. I enjoyed them immensely. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask was around CPTPP. Uh, the UK government has been vocal in our interest in potentially joining. Um, how do you think that will be received here? But also, how would an application from us compare to other countries that might be interested? Realistically, at this point in time, the CPTPP is going to come in, is going to enter into force at the end of the year, on the 30th of December. I think realistically, at this point in time, the countries involved, the 11 countries involved, will be very focused on getting the machine going. And uh, there are, besides the UK, there are many other countries that express interest to join the CPTPP. For Singapore, we see it as a positive development because it fits, this fits into the wider posture that we would like to see, that countries are working together for greater integration rather than fragmentation. So as and when the system is ready, as and when UK is ready, I'm quite sure the countries will welcome discussions with the UK, just as we welcome discussions with any other countries that express interest to join the CPTPP. Steve. Your, Excell Your Excellency, um, you've talked about the increasing in integration of ASEAN. I wonder if you would share any views you have on lessons learned by ASEAN from the EU experience of things not to do on the road towards integration. <laughs> <laughs> ASEAN is quite different from EU. The way ASEAN works is also quite different from EU. And that's because of history, that's because of the maturity of the institutions that you have versus the ASEAN. If EU is here, despite all its imperfections, the institutions in ASEAN are relatively less developed. And ASEAN also work on a slightly different basis of a consensus building. So you will find that in ASEAN, the level of development between the 10 different countries are also more disparate compared to perhaps the EU. But both face the same challenges. As the EU become bigger, the level of this development between different EU member states will also become more disparate. The interests will also become more disparate. What are some of the lessons we can learn? Uh, number one, 
we can only all move at the pace which everyone is comfortable with. Right? Sometimes uh, less haste, more speed. <laughs> uh, so this is one. Uh, but there's another lesson to be learned. That if you can't get everyone together, sometimes it's good to allow those who are more ready to do a pathfinder way forward. And then that allows others to build confidence and come on board and join. So I think these are common lessons learned, whether it's for EU or for ASEAN or for any regional arrangements. But one of the things that we must always bear in mind is that just because the level of development is more disparate, doesn't mean that it's more difficult for us to work together. Because again, as an economist, we always believe in the theory of comparative advantage. It doesn't mean that we must all be the same for closer collaboration and integration to happen. What it means is that we must each understand our relative strengths and weaknesses and see how we complement one another. And that, I think, will be the key to us all moving faster together. We're almost out of time, so if you don't mind, I'll ask just a couple more questions. You're part of the, the new generation of leadership in, in Singapore. How does Singapore position itself? Does it need to slightly reinvent itself in these extraordinary uncertain times? Is that around technology, which you touched on in your speech? Or is, is, is does Singapore see itself as a, as a leader in the region during these uncertain times? Singapore will always have to reinvent ourselves every generation, every few years, if not every year, if not every day. <laughs> we have never taken for granted our existence. Never. For those students of history, you will know that Singapore has never or never been allowed to be independent over the last few hundred years. The last 53 years, has been an aberration in history. For us to be independent, it takes tremendous effort. For us to create relevance to the world. The world is a harsh place. It, neither, it is neither charitable nor sympathetic to small states. And the history of city-states in the history of mankind has not been easy. The question for Singapore, be it 1965 or 2065, is fundamentally th this. How do we survive and thrive without a conventional hinterland? We have done that reasonably well over the last 53 years by connecting to the world. Connectivity to us it's not an option, nor a choice. It is our way to survive. In the last 53 years, connecting well to the rest of the world through the air, land and sea dimension has allowed us to transcend our geography and not be circumscribed by neither our geographical size or location. We see the world as our hinterland rather than just the physical space around us. Going forward in the next 50 years, the challenge will be similar. But we are confident because the world has changed. That beyond connecting through the air, land and sea dimensions, we will connect through four other non-physical dimensions. Data, finance, talent and technology. If we can do this well in across all the seven dimensions, then we would effectively grow the Singapore hinterland, that we are part of a global system, not just a regional system. Which is why connectivity and integration is so important to the survival of small states like Singapore. In the realm of data and finance, physical size is no longer a limitation. And that allows us to transcend our conventional limitations. So we are quietly 
confident. But in order for us to seize those opportunities, as you have suggested, we will have to constantly reinvent ourselves. And it goes back to how I was sharing that we have to prepare our workers and companies for the competition ahead of time. We have done well in the last 53 years in no small part to the fact that we are prepared to take the hard decisions to help our companies and people adjust ahead of time. We have a unique system in Singapore called tripartism to have the government, the business and the labour movement working closely together to enable our businesses to transform ahead of time, to equip our workers with the skills ahead of time. We never take this for granted. We constantly nurture this relationship. And we learn this from some of the Nordic countries, some of the Northern European countries. We learn it from them, we adapt it, and we continue to nurture it. So the new world of technology will present many opportunities for Singapore. So if you look at a conventional vertical manufacturing, we will never be able to compete with the Chinese and the Indians in terms of price or size or the scale of operations. But we compete on the basis of the quality of our products, the innovation of our system, and the assurance that we can give people. So in the lingo of the advanced manufacturing sector, we are into the high mix, low volume, high trust, high assurance sphere. And this is how Singapore has to continuously look for niche areas for us to create relevance to the global economic system, to the global production chain. And if we can stay focused and constantly challenge ourselves to do this, there's absolutely no reason why we can't continue the trajectory that we have been on. And our determination is to make sure that we continuously reinvent ourselves to be relevant to the world and to keep this dream of ours to be an independent country, not just surviving, but also thriving, and keep this dream going. Just finally, the Straits Times and its website is running a piece that there will be an announcement tomorrow on new leadership positions in Singapore. Can we expect something tomorrow? Well, if the Straits Times say we are expecting something tomorrow, then we must be ex ex expecting so you're something confirming tomorrow. It. <laughs> well, as we were walking in in Singapore, uh, our leadership model is one of continuity. And I think we can all expect that. That the way we do business and the way we relate to the world is that we provide a certain predictability, a certain continuity to how we do things. There are artificialities when people divide up the leadership into different generations, but there are also similarities that cut across each and every generation. And we have been fortunate in Singapore, not because we think that we have leaders who are cleverer than others, but we would like to pride ourselves that we have a leadership model that is stronger than the sum of the individual parts. In everywhere in the world, there are many clever people who aspire to be in leadership positions. But the crux of it is always this. What is the purpose, what's the goal for you to be in the leadership position? Is it for yourself or is it for the greater good of the country and its people? Countries that do well are those that are fortunate enough not just to have good individuals, but to have a strong team. A strong team that put aside the individual interests, but for the collective aspirations for the country. And in Singapore, we are proud to say that for the last 53 years, we have been able to find a leadership team or leadership teams that have been able to abide by this DNA and this set of ethos. And I think the younger generation of leaders 
are similar, are similarly focused on this, building the strongest team for Singapore to ensure that every generation of Singaporeans can continue this dream of ours to stay sovereign, independent, successful. That for each generation of Singaporeans, our definition of success is not how well we do for ourselves, but how well we enable the next generation to do even better for themselves. And that is how we will continue to take this country forward. Minister, with that, we have to leave it. Please join me in thanking Minister Chan Chan-Sang.